So we all use open source. So do we think of some of the issues which can crop up when we adopt open source? Or any software for that matter? Should we have a manifesto? OK, these are the things I should do when I'm adopting you or using open source. Because open source being a public good. So what we should we do? Should we have a manifesto? And what happens if we don't have a manifesto? Because these are the things normally we don't do, some of them, without evaluating for security vulnerabilities, without vetting it for the code quality, or it could be not reviewing for the license information or the legal information. Like it could be a copyright notice, it could be an attribution notice. Because each of those, them give you certain rights. Okay? And uh, all these years in the recent past, you know, during COVID times and other times, you would have seen there is so many vulnerabilities which has been detected. So what happens if there is a vulnerability, let's say, in any of the open source community? It spreads because the whole supply chain it affects. So it's very important that every person who is adopting or using open source, or for that matter, any software, has to make sure that they are looking at the vulnerability issues. They are taking uh, measures to you know, contain that. Or make sure that also look at the license information. Look for the code quality. Let's say you adopt a code from, or a library or a snippet from a project which is there is no contribution for months or years. There could be vulnerability there. Okay. You have not looked at the license information or the copyright notice, or some of this information has been deleted by the upstream users. So it is very important that whenever, because let's say you have not done these exercises, the downstream users will be affected. Because when he looks at the code, piece of code, there is no license information, there is no copyright information. So he feels that there is no obligation for him. So it is important that each of us, whenever we are adopting, whether you are a project, we are a company, you know, you are an individual contributor, please look into all these issues. So what are the benefits? You know, the open source uh, consumption manifesto helps in accountability. It creates awareness. There is collaboration. There is continuous improvement. So let's say. We have looked into the vulnerability, let's say, six months back. And we stopped that. Okay. I'm involved in some other project. So I've been pulled into some other project. I stopped that con uh, you know, continuous improvement. So that's a risky proposition. And today, with the changing times, you would have seen various log for jam issues, you know, colonial pipeline issues. Uh, all these issues are uh, being affecting the open source ecosystem. And today, when you are building a code or uh, you know, contributing to the open source ecosystem, it is being used across the globe. So the whole supply chain across the globe could be affected by one single act, non-action on your part. So it is very important that each of us, when we are adopting open source, and otherwise, what would happen? The whole uh, trust factor in the open source community will be lost. Because let's say we have a code base from Apache Foundation. We feel that, OK, this is from Apache Foundation. It's a well-known uh, project in the open source community. Let's use this. But there are you know, undesirable elements in the, also in the ecosystem. Who could put malware in the ecosystem in some of the projects? And especially, this has been seen in uh, you know, code uh, bases or projects, which has not been, con there is no contribution for ages. But these are fundamental uh, projects. Like, you know, you would have seen in JavaScripts some of the vulnerabilities. So if each of us who are adopting those pieces of code have been diligent in our own exercise when we are adopting it, let's also look at, from vulnerability perspective, legal issues, you know, when has been the last contribution happening, whether there is any maintenance exercise in those projects. So this is very important. So now let's look into the problems if we don't do this you know, proper adoption. It might be you know, a security vulnerability issue. It could be 
affecting the quality and reliability. It could affect your reputation as a project. So I'll give you an example. Uh, the company Equifax used Apache Stux. And the vulnerability was there in Apache Stux. It was, there was a patch provided by the Apache Foundation. Equifax did not fix the patch. They initially blamed for the data breach, and there was a huge data breach because of this. Equifax initially blamed Apache Foundation, that there is a vulnerability in Apache Foundation's Apache Stux. But what really happened was, Equifax Foundation guys did not fix the patch, and because of which there's a huge data breach. And to give you a background of Equifax, it is the credit trading agency, one of the largest in the world. In uh, US, it's one of the top four uh, credit rating agency. So huge amount of personal confidential information was breached. There was a huge fine. If they had done you know, the fixing of the patch, you know, this vulnerability would not happen. And in today's time when there is data production laws across the globe, this becomes very important because sensitive personal information is also stored. Confidential information also, company related information also would be stored. So it is very important that you know, all these issues should not arise if we take some basic measures. So what are the best practices we can adopt? Okay. So I would be only limiting it my talk to these best practices. Do we have an open source policy in our company or the project? What is an open source policy? Any answer, anybody? Have you seen an open source policy? What is an open source policy? So to put it briefly, open source policy for a company or a project would be, what are the guidelines for developers? OK, the engineering team. What, which code can be adopted? What is the vetting process for the code to be adopted? Which licenses can be adopted? In certain companies, it could be that GPL3 may not be adopted because GPL3 has a patent grant back. So if the company wants that the patent has to be received on that subject matter, they will not adopt a GPL3 uh, license. So which are the licenses applicable? What licenses you can do it, use for internal purposes? What projects you should be contributing to? What is the co contribution guidelines? So all this will be summed up in your, what is the, uh, you know, who will cross-check this? What is the process of cross-checking? All this will be stated in your open source policy. Now let's look into the global best practices. So open chain, so open chain now has been considered as an ISO standard. It has been adopted as an ISO standard. So open chain is a Linux Foundation project. So if you see the whole supply chain of software, so today, companies or projects will be contributing. Their code will be used by uh, companies across the globe. Let's say uh, it's a car. The software is being developed in X country. There will be vendors like that who will be contributing that software for multiple uh, you know, players in the ecosystem. So each player, if they are not compliant, okay, they have, don't have the same standards of compliance of code of legal issues, non-compliance issues, vulnerability issues, the whole supply chain can be affected. So it is very essential that, how do you make sure that everybody, every vendor of yours is compliant, is on the same page? There could be big vendors, there could be small vendors, and if even one of them, one of the vendors is not compliant, the whole supply chain can be affected. So, Open Chain has various levels of specifications. Open, open Chain 1.0, that's the basic specification. 1.1, 2, 2.1. 2.1 has been adopted as the ISO standard, which is here. So what does this Open Chain talk about? You can do a self-certification for your project or a company, where you certify that, OK, what are the certification requirements? If it is a basic certification, which is Open Chain 1.0, you will ha whether you have an open source policy, whether you do training to your employees. Because as a developer, young developer, I don't know what is the compliance required. 
what is vulnerability, what is the vulnerability test I have to do, which are the licenses I can use, whether there is a license com inc compatibility or incompatibility. All these issues I should know. But as a young uh, you know, uh, developer, I may not be knowing this. So the other thing is having a software bill of material. What is a software bill of material? Let's say we, I buy a Parley G biscuit. The ingredient list is there. The same way in a software, the whole ingredient list of the complete stack. So why this is very important is, let's say tomorrow there is a vulnerability detected. Uh, let's say X version of that software, that uh, project. You know whether in your stack that uh, code, piece of code, or that version is being used. So if that was, so you remember I talked about the Equifax case? So if Equifax had a software bill of material, and it knew that, OK, there is a uh, vulnerability which is detected in Apache Stacks, it could have patched it. But if they don't have a software bill of material, so the complete ingredient list, if they don't have, if there is a vulnerability, they, they can't patch it. Because they don't know what is there in my stack. So it is very important that you have a software bill of material. So there are best practices even for software bill of material. Uh, in the US government has now mandated it. After the Colonial Pipeline case, Solar Wind case, uh, the US government has mandated that every software which the US government is using, you, are, you might be a supplier to the US government, you are providing an app to the US government, any department, central or state, you have to have a software bill of material. Because you will get a visibility on the uh, complete stack. So there is XPDX. So that's also an ISO standard today. So you can use XPDX or any of the other standards, Cyclone DX or any of those standards. But it would be better that you use XPDX because that's a ISO standard now. Now, coming to the global, uh, you know, other best practices. So you should also do be doing legal compliance. So when I say legal compliance, it would also ensure that so open chain will be another best place to do the legal compliance. So as I said, having an open source policy, looking for the licenses, code analysis, license checks. So even as XPDX, when you do that, uh, you know some of the license checks is already done there at the bi-daily level also. So now the other good initiative is the open SSF, Open Source Security Foundation, which is again a Linux Foundation project. So after all these incidents of Colonial Pipeline, uh, Log4Jam, NPM PM, uh, vulnerability, and all these things, the foundation has come forward. So you are, let's say you are an open source project anywhere in the world. You can go to the badges. So there are different level of badges as per your uh, compliance level. <coughs> so there is silver badge, there's gold badge. And once you are compliant, with the requirement of OpenSSF, you can put that badge on your website. So that creates a trust in your project that you are OpenSSF. So anybody in the world will, OK, look at it, that project and see, OK, these guys have got this silver badge or a gold badge. So they are standards. So more companies or more projects will adopt your code if your project or your company has so many more badges. It creates a uh, sense of trust. So uh, I would urge you, if you want to look more into the open chain uh, specifications, and anybody in the ecosystem can contribute to the open source. So there are some training uh, materials also available on open chain. So which is free of cost. We can, any of you can train. You don't, need not be a lawyer. You, you, need, you could be a developer. You could be a contributor, anybody. And it's free of cost. So please make sure that you. Uh, enjoy the benefit of you know understanding the global best practices. So there is also open chain uh, security assurance. This is also an ISO standard. So for vulnerability and other issues, for quality of your code and everything, you can look into the open source uh, open chain security assurance. And this is also an ISO standard. And uh, if you are compliant with all these things, again as I said. It, ha it can be used as your marketing material also. As a company, uh, you know, globally everybody would, if you have an ISO standard, people will be more uh, you know, eager to adapt your uh, products or services. So it's very important that you, know, you comply with the best practices. So uh, as I told you, the US government also has, through an executive order, 
has uh, made sure that uh, software bill of material is there. Uh, whether you are a private company, you are a public uh, entity, you should have a software bill of material. And even in other parts of the world, whether it is Europe and slowly other uh, governments are also adopting it. So these are the, some of the major uh, things which uh, happened in the past, which, uh, which creates the need for having an open source adoption manifesto. So I think my time is over. Anybody, any questions? Don't worry if you don't have questions right now, even that's OK. Uh, because you know I'm here the till the lunch time. Any time you have any questions you want to talk to me, I'll be here. So my contact details are here. So please feel free to you know reach out to me.